My name's Jim Horman. I'm the, uh, uh, I was a county extension educator for uh, about 24 years, to, uh, and uh, then I uh, left, and now I work for uh, uh, NRCS, USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service. I'm a regional soil health specialist. So the topic today is uh, mycorrhizae. I've got one slide uh, that we're going to start with, and I'll show you that in just a minute. But uh, I was at a conference here. It's just amazing how much new information keeps coming out. You know, everybody tells me, Jim, your slides are too long. And uh, just about every time I go to a conference, I got about 10 more slides to add in because there's so much new information coming out. So I'm going to add just one. Uh, how many of you guys have heard about Metarhizium fungi? Anybody? Anybody heard of Metarhizium fungi? Well, it's one you ought to put on your radar because here's what it does. It has three major things, and I'll show you the slide in a minute. First of all, it's a major paratosoid for 200 insects. Okay, what does that mean? That means that uh, this paratosoid, what it does is it, it lays its spores and its eggs on the eggs, the larvae, and the grubs of insects, and it just forms a blanket around them, a nice tight little blanket, and it just sucks the juices out of them, okay? And so it mummifies them. And I'll show you a picture here in a little bit to just show you what that looks like. Number two is it also, once those fungi start to, those, those, uh, they start to germinate, and they form a hyphae, just like the, the mycorrhizae, okay? So they form this hyphae in the soil, and they attach to plants, and I don't know what the mechanism is, but they enhance nitrogen uptake. All right, so there's two major things that they do. There's about 13 species of them. We're finding out that they're uh, very important in no-till, and uh, they, they like to have a, a growing crop out there. So, and then the third thing they do, we actually know how to replicate these uh, in the lab because we do it all the time. What do we use them for? Well, they have an enzyme in them that we use to convert soybeans into soybean diesel. Okay, so there's all three things that they do right there. Okay, they're very specialized. And just look at that grasshopper. They just put a real nice coat on that grasshopper, and they just suck the juices right out of them. I can't think it's anything that would be, got to be, it must not feel too good, I'm sure, but uh, I'm not too upset about it because it, uh, uh, it does help us. Now, one downside, we'll take the good with the bad, they do kill a few beneficials. But if they're killing all, if they can keep ahead of, a, of the bad guys, that's what we want. So again, those are the three major things. Now, if you guys are interested, next year, one of the ladies that I learned this from was Mary Barbacek. And I've already got her set up to maybe come to CTC next year and talk a little bit more about this, because this is something that I'm really starting to dwell into. I really think this could be the counterpart to our mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizae are really good for phosphorus, a lot of micronutrients, and water enhancement. We've got one that really helps us with nitrogen enhancement. We've got these things going on in the soil. We're just starting to learn about them, okay? So it's one that I really think you guys need to know about. This is what we're going to talk about today. These are the mycorrhizae. Uh, mycorrhizae kind of means uh, fungus, and rhizae means root, okay? So it's a fungus root, okay? This relationship has been going on for about 400 to 450 million years, okay? And here's what we did, we, they found out. Originally, about 80-85% of our plants, some say as many as 90%, have this mycorrhizal relationship. Come to find out that when plants first grew, they really didn't have the roots weren't for nutrient uptake so much as they were for mycorrhizae infection. They let the mycorrhizae go out there. Some of these networks will get on a root hair. Okay, and these mycorrhizae are one-tenth the size of this root hair, and they'll extend out anywhere from 6, 12 inches, 18 inches away from that plant, bringing back nutrients that that plant is signaling that it wants. And so we have somewhere like 150 species of these mycorrhizae. Some say there's actually more than that. 
Most of them, there's a lot of different ones. There's some sp very specific for trees. There's some that are, uh, the ones in agriculture are pretty general. So for example, if I have a corn plant, there could be, and I've got a list. I actually spent some time and got a list of the different species, okay? And there's about 30, maybe almost 40 different species that will infect that corn. Each one may have a little bit specialized function that it does, okay? One may bring back mainly phosphorus. Another one may be, bring back zinc. One may bring back more water, okay? And so we want to really enhance mycorrhizae development. I'll, we'll go through what will enhance them and what will cause them to, to go down, okay? So again, this has been around for a long period of time. We've got about five different types. The ones that we're interested in are the ones that affect our agricultural plants. Those are generalists. That means they will infect a lot of different plants, sometimes at the same time, okay? And, they're, and uh, they're not nearly as specific. Now you get into the ones that are the ectos. The ectos are the ones that uh, infect uh, trees and shrubs and things like that, okay? Those tend to be more specialized, but we're looking at the endos. These were the early colonizers. They're very well uh, studied, and so uh, they're very common in agriculture. This just shows you some of the, the different structures. We talk about this arbuscular. That arbuscular looks like kind of like a tree. That's what that, but what it'll do is it'll infect this root, gets inside that cell, and it exchanges. That's where the sugars are exchanged. The plant will feed it some sugars, but in order to get fed, it's got to bring back something to that plant, either water, phosphorus, or a micronutrient, okay? And then what happens is these become like almost like hair extenders, but root extenders, okay? They go out in the soil. The reason it works so well is they, uh, these mycorrhizae are one-tenth the size of a root hair, okay? Now, we have a lady here, Christine Jones. Uh, she's going to be talking a little bit about this. And I saw, I think it was a reference from her that said, if you have a really, really healthy soil, just to give you an idea how, how much area they cover, I think it was four meters by four meters, and probably, I don't know, six inches, most of them are probably within that top foot, that you've got enough mycorrhizae in there to go all the way around the equator of the earth, okay? So think about the amount of surface area that these things enhance our plant uh, root development, okay? So that's what we're, we're looking at. That's why they're so important. Again, just some more things here. Uh, just shows you how they kind of infect that plant and then they extend out, all right? Let's go to the next one. These show some of those vesicles. This is where they store a lot of their nutrients uh, in the, from, from those mycorrhizae, okay? So those are the storage areas in that plant. About 90% of all plant species are associated with that. 60% are very uh, specific. As we said, there's about 150, maybe as many as 250. The ones that we really, if you want to enhance mycorrhizal development in the species diversification, oats, sorghum, sedan, sorghum sedan, all those hybrids, red clover, we now know that uh, sunflower, I should add that one, is also very good at enhancing mycorrhizae. There are some species, though, that don't enhance them. Most of those are in the brassicas, your radish, your kale, your rape, uh, spinach, uh, buckwheat are some that do not enhance them, okay? So these are the ones, that radish, turnip, kale, rape, um, some of the beets, the spinach, the rhubarb, all those don't have mycorrhizal development, okay? Now, what if I decide that I want to put one of these in, say, a four-way, five-way, ten-way mixture? Are they going to hurt? Well, the answer is, uh, the research is a little uncertain about that, but it seems like if you've got a mixture of things, it's not a problem. However, if I plant buckwheat in front of corn, it does hurt if that's the only species that I plant because these mycorrhizae need to have a host plant. As long as there's a host plant out there and they can reproduce and they're fine uh, and they're fed, all right? But if you got too many, for example, if you had a, a straight monoculture of buckwheat or something like that, then you could hurt your corn production, all right? So you want to be careful that you don't, uh, that you understand some of these relationships, all right? 
A lot of the mycorrhizae have been nearly eliminated from our agricultural tilled soil. So if you look at a field on the right, that's the prairie fields. Uh, and then you compare that to the agricultural fields. And you'll notice that there is a tremendous difference. These are the things that hurt. Tillage, seasonal fallow, because these plants want to be fed, or these mycorrhizae want to be fed, all right? Annual fallow, monocropping. They really like to have a lot of different uh, species. Uh, that's why we really can enhance mycorrhizal development if we get, uh, uh, if we start, because we'll get some of these are very, very sensitive, okay? And the reason this is so important is some of these species may infect only a small part of the root and, and may not have, there may not be very many of them, but they take this much carbon and they give us this much benefit. Other ones we're going to find out, and there's a certain species called rhizophagus. Rhizophagus is everywhere, okay? It really dominates because it can tolerate the tillage. Well, it's almost a pathogen. So what happens is it takes this much carbon and it gives us about this much benefit, okay? So you have to be very careful if you decide you're going to try to buy these, uh, a lot of times what people or, or companies will sell you is the ones that have uh, the easiest to produce. And that would be probably those rhizophages. Well, you've already got rhizophages in your soil. You really don't need that one. Here's the problem with this, this whole thing. First of all, we don't know what we have in the soil. Until we know what we have in the soil, Second of all, we're not going to be able to, to move forward on this. So first of all, you need to know what you got in the soil. Second of all, you need to know what they do so that we can select ones that will give us the benefits. So that's this whole area of research now. What do they do? And then third, you've got to find somebody that can supply that one. And then two, you've, the fourth thing is you've got to get them, have the right conditions so that they'll proliferate in your soil. This is not an easy thing, folks. But it is important. Here's the good news. If you follow our four basic principles, you will promote mycorrhizae development. What is the NRCS four basic prin principles? Number one, minimize that soil disturbance. Number two is maximize those live roots. I always got to do this or I don't remember. Okay, this, the third thing is what? Maximize that surface cover, both above ground and what's on the, on, the, on the surface. And number four, increase biodiversity. Those four things will greatly enhance our mycorrhizal development. Okay? These are the other things, though. Fungicide applications, soil compaction are all detrimental to these and too much fertilizer. If I put out too much phosphorus or any kind of fertilizer, the plant says, hey, I don't need you and then the plant's not going to feed the mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizae only get fed as long as they're bringing back nutrients that the plant wants and needs at that time. If that plant can get them for free, uh, she'll, the, the, that plant will say, hey, I don't need to feed you, and then it'll lose its mycorrhizal development. Until what happens? Until we get some stress and all of a sudden we get a drought or something rather, then that plant will be begging for mycorrhizal development. Well, it doesn't happen overnight, folks. It takes a little while to get this going, okay? So that's part of the issue there. Just shows you again the difference between the prairie and the cropland. Look at the prairie here. They're very plump. The way we determine what kind of mycorrhiza you have in the soil is by the spores, okay? And so we have very plump and we have a lot of diversity in the prairie. Look at the one above it. It's just those little white ones. Those white ones, are, a lot of those are the rhizophages. And unfortunately, there's not nearly as much diversity. They tend to be gray. They tend to be shrunken. And they just don't work nearly as well. Okay? So that's part of our, our issue there. Plant exchange, uh, carbon exchange uh, with the, the mycorrhizae, uh, uh, the carbon dioxide, uh, they're spending almost as much as 40% of their energy, 25 to 40% of their energy goes to feed these mycorrhizae, okay? So you know that it has an important function, okay? What the plant has decided is that it's easier to contract out and have somebody else do the work than for them to invest a lot of energy into roots because we know on a corn plant, that that corn plant by itself will explore 1% of the soil volume. 
When you have these mycorrhizae, they explore 20%. Okay, it's cheaper for that plant from an energy standpoint to invest in the mycorrhizae, and that's what they're doing. So this just shows you all the symbol, what the carbon fixation uh, looks like. We're we may be putting over five billion tons of carbon per year into the soil just from these mycorrhizae. Okay, they greatly enhance carbon retention. They're about 40 to 55 percent, 45, 55 percent efficient at keeping carbon in compared to bacteria. Bacteria is only about 20 to 30 percent. Okay, that's why it's so important. What do they do? Here's 16 things that came from Wendy to Harry. Uh, they increase soil fertility, they build your soil structure, they increase your water holding capacity, they produce more nutritious food for both humans and livestock. It's going to be better quality, have higher protein, things like that. Uh, replace harmful uh, chemicals. They detoxify a lot of these chemicals, okay? They eliminate nutrient runoff and uh, leaching. They, uh, because they so effectively keep these nutrients recycling in the soil, they increase plant use efficiency, uh, uh, particularly with phosphorus, and they increase some of these essential oils uh, in, in the production, okay? So they're just helping uh, that plant be a little more healthy. They protect it from nematodes. They protect it from fungi and bacteria diseases, help with drought. Very important in salinity. We don't have that issue around here because we get plenty of, of moisture. They help with a little bit earlier flowering, more flowers, more fruit. More biomass equals increased yields. They sequester that carbon in the soil. And they, uh, pollinators have been found that they prefer mycorrhizal plants. So these are the six reasons that uh, Dr. Wendy Tahiri came up with. And I thought it was pretty important that you, you be able to know what they all do. Okay. So a couple things that they help us with that we're going to talk about. They help us with that water transport. We're going to talk a little bit about the micronutrients they bring back. They also bind calcium and uh, keep it from leaching out, okay? One of the things that we hear all the time is guys that are doing no-till on a cover crop, they have a lot better calcium efficiency. Uh, they don't have to use quite as much lime, okay? And part of that is because we're building soil organic matter, and that soil organic matter buffers pH, but it's also because of this, the, the way that it works with calcium. A lot of things going on there that we're still learning. And they also help us with weed suppression and communication and the plant defense, okay? So in drought resistance, let's start with the water. What do they do? They help that hyphae will scour that soil for water. One of the things that I, I read in a couple of books, there's a number of different books out that are really great about this, says those, those hyphae that are in the soil act like little reservoirs. They'll trap water in those reservoirs, and during a drought, they'll feed that water to the plant. Okay, so it, it's very uh, effective at getting water into the plant. It's like a giant hyphae out there. They're just like little sponges taking up the, the moisture. They retain that water, release it slowly, and then a lot of this water isn't plant available, but they make it plant available. That microscopic water, they can get to it, okay? And so they just greatly enhance water use efficiency. Here's a couple different species, just to give you an idea. Now, we're not going to uh, raise the one that says uh, that Glomus uh, desert. We're, we have the wrong conditions. But just to give you an idea, in the desert, they can increase your, your water efficiency by 250, 150, 200%. Okay, so it just shows you that they have done some experiments on these things and they really help. These are all the minerals that help that the mycorrhizae help that plant to thrive. Okay, so they help us with all the macros, pretty much all the secondary, and then also some of these other very micronutrients. So they are very important. Okay, that plant needs 10 times more nitrogen than it does phosphorus. And these mycorrhizae are very good at also enhancing nitrogen uptake, okay? They uh, these plants uh, will bring it back in the form of nitrates and ammonium, okay? Now, the problem is that, that sometimes ammonia, they, they, um, they may have a, uh, it may be a little toxic to them. So generally, most of the time, the plant likes it. Uh, if it's too toxic, these mycorrhizae will actually detoxify 
uh, some of the, uh, of the nitrogen there. But if it gets too high, well, then they won't be able to feed it to that plant. So you got to be a little bit careful what, what form you get. Ammonium uh, is about 25% more efficient. Uh, the problem is it can also be a little toxic. So, okay, so uh, got to look at that. This just shows you that hyphae, uh, how far they extend. Again, they're one-tenth the size of a root hair. They excrete uh, enzymes. They're also kind of a microbial regulator. They actually feed the microbes from the plants, and they kind of control what microbes get fed depending on what nutrient that they want. So they got all these little chemical signals going on underneath the, in the soil that will tell them what they want to do. So they have a, a great relationship with the, the, the bacteria. They're also physically enhancing that soil. We'll, we'll talk about about that in a little bit, all right? And then in high phosphorus soils, crops do not form the, the, these mycorrhizal relationships as well. They'll still form them, but if that plant can get all the phosphorus it needs, it may not want to invest very much money into these mycorrhizae. Now, interesting thing, I've watched this at some of our sites where we're doing long-term no-till with cover crops, comparing that to no-till fields, and then fields that have conventional soil. And one of the things that I notice is that we hardly ever see purple corn. The corn uh, where we have the no-till and the cover crops, we no longer see that. Now, a lot of our, our varieties have started to uh, have been developed so that we don't see that as much. But under, uh, under uh, the right conditions, you can still see purpling of corn. So cold, wet conditions, generally, those are the type of things. Uh, but... Generally, what we're seeing is that corn never, ever turns purple. I think it's because we've got very good mycorrhizal development going on there, okay? So that's something that we, we want to uh, understand. Okay, they get some of this uh, phosphorus. Uh, the mycorrhizae gets some of it from the iron. And you guys have heard me talk about the iron. We're not going to go into that too much. Uh, but they make it soluble, which then becomes plant available. So if you don't have phosphorus or you think you don't have phosphorus in your soil, these mycorrhizae can actually make some of that phosphorus that's not available, make it available because of some of the chemical reactions that it's doing, okay? It will feed certain bacteria and things like that that will release the phosphorus. And I kind of look at the mycorrhizae as just freight trains. Okay, what they do is they go out, they search for it, and they transport it back to the plant. Okay, these networks that go out through the soil. But they kind of contract some of this out to some of the different bacteria and the other microorganisms that will make it available, and then they transport it back. Up to 42% of our nitrogen comes from the, the mycorrhizae in carrot roots. Very small amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus can be transferred from one plant to the other, okay? Really, that's a pretty small amount. It's interesting, though, when you get into some of the other species, some of the ectos, it's interesting. They actually did studies. Most of these studies were done where a mother tree had some, some uh, seedlings, and the mycorrhizal network was there, and the mother was actually, the mother tree was actually transporting a little bit of nitrogen to some of her seedlings, okay? That's where we've seen it. I don't know that we've ever seen it in corn. But just to imagine this, guys, you could have 10, 15, 20 different kernels of corn, okay? Plants coming up, and you've got these networks, and all these plants are tied together, okay, by that mycorrhizal network. If you have a no-till field, you've got these networks going across that field, and they can all kind of communicate with each other. And we're going to find out that that's really important for plant defense, uh, defense mechanisms, okay? Now, if I'm in a conventional field, do I have that same network? Well, you may have some networks, but that mycorrhizae has to spend an awful lot of its energy building this network back every year when you do the tillage. And the problem with the tillage is some of the very sensitive species get lost, okay? They just can't tolerate all that tillage. So it's kind of important as we start to learn this or some things that we can do to help us out. Got to look at the time. It's like we're about halfway up. So like I said, 
just showing you how that network works. There's about 150, 250 species. But look at the phosphorus on the right-hand side, left-hand side here. Look at the nitrogen and the phosphorus and how far that root can go by itself. Now, if I extend this network out, now I can start to reach some of these elements that are a little bit further away, okay? And some of these are very specific, like for this one that's got an S on it. That means it's helping to enhance sulfur, okay? Bringing sulfur in. Other ones may just bring in nitrogen. Other ones may bring in just uh, phosphorus, okay? So there's a lot of different specialized functions going on that we're just starting to learn about. Just shows you some of the elements that are, are brought in. So this is no mycorrhizae are the dark ones. Okay, and with the mycorrhizae, we got a little extra copper, quite a bit of extra zinc, and quite a bit of extra phosphorus coming in, okay? And look at the dry weight of these plants. So these plants tend to be healthier. They tend to do better where we have mycorrhizal development, okay? What do the fungi get from the plant? Well, it's an energy source. They have to have, they're highly dependent on that plant. They can't live by themselves. Uh, they also get the simple sugars, the glucose from them. Uh, their host, their habitat, it's a very much a symbiotic uh, relationship. If the host plants dies, then that fungus is going to die. Okay, so that's what's uh, important. Again, how much do we get back? Six times more phosphorus. It's pretty hard to access that soil of phosphorus. Water can be 150 to 250. 15%. Most of the time, we're probably not going to get that much because the one that does the 215% has to live in a desert, okay? They help us with pest, pest protection from weeds, insects, and diseases, and they regulate that soil microbial uh, population, and then they improve the soil structure, okay? So, this just shows you a corn plant. When do they do most of this infection? It's early on, okay? As that plant starts to mature, it needs a, uh, uh, the, the mycorrhizae development starts to go down. So as corn gets closer and closer to maturity, uh, especially when that corn's starting to dry down, these mycorrhizae start to look for a different host because the plant isn't feeding them. So early on, it's the most important. Most sugar production, 70%, comes when that corn is about 12 to 24 inches. Grain filling, fruit stage, few sugars go into the roots because uh, the soil now uh, uh, because of the soil reserves. Okay. Uh, this is a study that just shows root colonization was increased the most by inoculation was 29%. If you shorten that fallow system, that improved it by 20%, so cover crops help. Really no-till maybe not as important as just having a live plant out there and trying to get the mycorrhizae. Now, if I don't have mycorrhizae there, how do they get there? Well, tomorrow you're going to hear me talk about voles and slugs, okay? And one of the ways that, uh, that we have of getting some of these spores, there can be anywhere from 8 to 90 spores in about a gram of soil, okay? And find out that a lot of them are windblown, but also those voles, when they go out into these uh, non-disturbed areas, they're picking up the spores on their little feet, and they'll transport them into your fields and re-inoculate a field. So everything we kind of want to keep in balance. We don't want to get rid of all our voles. First of all, if we got rid of all our voles, pretty soon we wouldn't have any predators, and then the voles would come back. When they do come back, they'll come back with a vengeance. So we're trying to keep this balance in everything that we do, okay? That's what we're looking at. Weeds tend to be non-mycorrhizal hosts because weeds grow best in disturbed soils, okay? Now, there are some weeds that are highly mycorrhizal. Foxtail is a grass, okay? So some of those grasses can be, be mycorrhizal, but other ones uh, are much less so. So generally what happens is you get a competitive edge with your mycorrhizal plants because with this mycorrhizal, they'll grow faster, they'll shade it, and they can compete for the nutrients. So generally what happens is a lot of the weed species start to, to die out or don't reproduce. So that's kind of how these things help out. They, they've been found to suppress weeds by up to uh, the biomass by up to 25%, just where you have the mycorrhizae, okay? They can help us with soybean cyst nematode. Damage offset in this study was 30, 36%, okay? These are all the species 
that the mycorrhizae have been found to help us with. Look at all these uh, diseases. Look at the major ones. You got anthracnose, fusarium, pythium, uh, phytophthora, rhizactonia, verticulum wilt. These mycorrhizae are very good at enhancing and, and reducing the amount of disease in the soil. I think they do it a couple ways. One, they change that environment. So we get better root development, healthier plants, we have better drainage. A lot of these diseases are dependent on poor soil structure, okay? But also, what do they do? They will, uh, uh, as that plant's growing, they put a layer of what we call chitinden. It's the same thing that's in insects. And they, they actively protect that plant. And then just the physical act of them infecting that, that uh, corn root or soybean root, it doesn't allow any other pathogens to get access to that root. So they're going to protect that, that, that root with their life because their life is dependent on that host uh, producing, okay? So that's why we want to really enhance these things. There's a lot of different diseases that they've discovered that really help with this. They outcompete the pathogens for the carbon stocks. They reduce all these diseases. They're really important because they increase arginine, okay? That's an amino acid in the soil, and that's what helps to enhance nitrogen uptake, okay? And they increase that lignin and that chitinin in that uh, soil to protect it, okay? Just shows you here, this would be a, a corn plant, and we get this little predator that comes in here. And what happens is, when a predator comes in here, all of a sudden, these plants, because they're all connected together, this is like the internet, all right? They, they send out all these signals, and they warn the other ones, and then pretty soon these plants start putting off compounds that will fight those predators. So. Plants that have a really good communication network, you can imagine, same thing applies in our system here. We got good telephones, good communication. If somebody has a fire, we can get to that fire a lot quicker than if we're living all by ourselves, okay? And that's kind of what's going on here. They can help each other out, all right? How do they uh, decrease the pathogens? Uh, they influence how, what microbial species will grow. Uh, they immobilize that plant defense. They send out these chemical systems. They also just increase that nutrient stash. Just make that plant a little healthier, okay? Insects are attracted to low protein plants, and what these um, mycorrhizae will do is they enhance the amino acids that are in that plant so that those sugars can become amino acids, which can become peptides, which then become the, the, the proteins, okay? So if we enhance that, then these insects aren't going to want to attack this plant. So that they also help with insect uh, suppression. They also form more highly structured compounds in that plant, which the insects can't break down. So we all know that really a lot of these healthy plants, the healthier your plant is, the less problem that you've got. Okay, looking at my time, I want to make sure I stay on time here. They help to form soil aggregates, okay? So what they do is they physically wrap that soil particle, and they, there's a compound called glomalin or glomulin, okay? Now, there's some new research out that says glomalin, glomulin may not just be associated with these fungi. There's a lot of different things that actually may produce this, but we do know that the mycorrhizae do enhance that. And so what happens is I've got all these networks going out into the soil, and we always got soil disturbance. So these networks are always breaking off. So part of this mycorrhizal network may become detached, and they'll leak out some of the, the glomulin, the cell structure, uh, the cell, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, the, the glues inside of there. And when that gets out into the soil, it kind of wraps these soil particles together, and that's what we call our macro aggregates, okay? So when you have really good soil structure, if you're digging in the soil and that soil just crumbles, that's what we, we like to see. Well, some of that's due to not only the plants, but the mycorrhizae, but also the bacteria poop. And all those things together help to make, give us good soil structure. So soils that are really healthy are going to have a lot better soil structure, and the mycorrhizae are part of that whole system. Okay, they create these stable organic matter. It's really good at digesting the lipids, and they also uh, help to form the humus. Okay, so these are the different mycorrhizae. If you look at them, they're either white or yellow. The one in the back is actually a root. Okay, so that's brown. It's light brown. You'll see these little clumps 
sometimes in the soil. And what that is, that's not one single mycorrhizae or hyphae, okay? It's a whole bunch of them twisted together. Okay, and sometimes you can see them. I know uh, Alan and I were at a field day, and, and we would dig some of these up to show guys within five minutes, guys, b before the next group could even get to us. We had 20-minute stops. We'd have to dig another one because they get highly desiccated once you expose them to atmosphere, okay? They disappear. You couldn't see them anymore. So you want to look for these in the soil. Uh, you might see some of the, these white masses out there. This is that glomalion. Uh, uh, it, it's in that, uh, that hyphae. And then what it does is it gets into uh, your, your plants uh, on your soil structure. It's a glycoprotein. It's 4 to 6% uh, sugar. It coats and protects the hyphae. It, it's a uh, heat and enzy uh, enzymatically stable. And it's very complex, okay? And it is hydrophobic. So what does that mean? That means that when it uh, gets around that soil, it actually has a hydrophobic, which means it won't let the water in. So the water will collect, go around it. That will make that macroaggregate a little bit more stable. Now, a lot of water can get collected inside that macroaggregate, so it can be stored in there. And then once that soil starts to dry out a little bit, if it gets a little dry, it will open up. It releases the water. It also releases the water in the, the hyphae to the, to the plants. Okay, So a little bit about what's going on there. Uh, this is that macro aggregate, okay? That's what it's helping to form, okay? So what are some compounds that increase the mycorrhizae? So I've got compounds that help. I've got compounds that don't. And this is just a list that I've put together. There are some good fungicides. So apron and ritamel are actually beneficial. Don't know why. I've never been able to find the literature to say why, but uh, several books have said... Hey, metal axle in April and rental mill actually increases mycorrhizal infection. So not all fungicides are the same. There's actually some good chemical compounds, the flavonoids, the isoflavonoids, the carbamates, the, the, a uh, couple of those type of things. Herbicides, for some reason, simazine or princept is better than atrazine, okay? So if you're going to use in corn, if you've got a choice, you might try to use Princept. It will increase the root exudates and it helps with the colonization. Amino acids that it really likes, it likes the arginine, the lysine, the cysteine. A lot of these are high in sulfur, so it must help it uh, some way. The tryptophan. Uh, some salts are actually good. Some of these potassium salts, I don't know what that one is. be honest with you, some of these things i got to look up a little bit more. And then for some reason it likes a couple hormones that really increase mycorrhizal development. We do know that in a greenhouse, most of the time we can't manipulate this, but anytime you increase the light, you're going to have better microbial colonization just simply because you got more sugars being produced by those plants and they will feed your mycorrhizal. So if you have a greenhouse, you can manipulate this by turning the lights on, having a little bit more lights available. Okay, Things that will hurt them, uh, a lot of the fungicides. So we have the fuller applications of some of the non-systematic uh, uh, ones outside. They don't have nearly as much impact as the ones at the bottom. Your soil drenches, the benolate is really deadly to mycorrhizae, okay? So benolate uh, and, and some of those things. Some of your more systematic fungicides that are taken up by the plant, they can kill the, the mycorrhizae. You can have a suppression for about three weeks. Now, one of the questions that I got recently was, what about these seed treatments? And the answer on that is we're seeing a lot of awful lot of pythium and uh, fusarium out there. So should I put a fungicide on my seed treatment? And probably the best thing I can tell you is a little bit of fungicide on that seed treatment to prevent the pathogens probably isn't going to hurt because think about how much you're putting on. And remember, as this seed grows, it's going to expand out into the soil. So you might kill some of the, the fungi, these mycorrhizae are real close to the seed, but really that seed has enough 
energy in it for that plant to probably live for uh, uh, at least one or two weeks, okay? As that plant roots get away from that seed, now you can have the mycorrhizal development further away from the seed. So I don't think fungicides right on the seed are going to be nearly as bad as fungicides that are throughout that soil profile. That could be a, a much bigger issue, okay? So just giving you a couple things you might want to look at. Compounds that decrease the mycorrhizae, there is one reference to glyphosate as a herbicide, but some of these other compounds, uh, things like benolate and, and benamil, uh, you've got the uh, captan, the thyram, the, the carboxin, uh, a lot of these uh, aromatic hydro compounds, your uh, copper compounds, you've got to be a little bit careful with. Brassicas, we know that the glycinate in the radishes, the radish don't allow these things to grow. So again, you don't want to overdo the radish too much. We're going to put them in a mixture, put them in at a small amount, and they'll be fine because it seems like radish makes a lot of these nutrients available. When those radishes die out, then the, the mycorrhizae, if they're around that, they may be able to pull some of that back to another plant, okay? But uh, you got to be a little careful on, on your mixtures, okay? Three ways the mycorrhizae will reproduce. They reproduce by spores, by root fragments, and these external hyphae, okay? we got about 15 minutes. There are some species that only use spores, and then there's some species that use all three methods, okay? The difference is on the spores, it's going to take a little longer, okay? So there's a tremendous amount of spores out there, uh, but you got to develop that whole uh, hyphae network, okay? In the root fragments, uh, if you've got the roots in there, they can actually, that, that arbuscular can, can actually form another hyphae, so that's a way. And then if you've already got the network, well, that's probably already the fastest way. All it has to do is if a new plant starts growing, it will reattach, okay? And that's what, what goes on. So just shows you all the different spores out there. This is how we identify the mycorrhizae. You can't figure out what the mycorrhizae are by just looking at them. Uh, under a microscope, you have to look at the spores. And we recently, I, about a couple years ago, I took a very, very expensive course, okay? Dave was there. We spent $500 on this microscope, and I was a little misled. I'm a little embarrassed about this, guys. Uh, uh, problem was, uh, we had a teacher that came in, and uh, she said, well, I can tell you whether you have the mycorrhizae or not. Well, that's good to know, but I said, I thought we were going to learn how to do the species. She says, oh, no, if you want that done, that's $5,000. <sighs> so the good news is we, and, and that was extremely, extremely labor intensive, wasn't it, Ann? Ann did. Ann was a trooper. I mean, she was out there. She was telling us that we needed to dig 10 corn plants, and we needed to do this, and I mean, I, I got about 10 minutes into there, and I started scratching my head, and I started cussing myself out. I said, anyways, you can tell, all right? Well, here's the good news. You don't have to do all that work anymore. They just recently, they're, they're going to um, release this pretty soon. You can test it by actually taking leaf samples, and there's a compound that they've determined that the plant releases if it's already mycorrhizae infected, okay? Quite frankly, I'm not too worried about mycorrhizae infection because there's so many different species. All these plants have mycorrhizae infected. What do we really want to know? We want to know what species we have, what species we need, and what species, how, how can I get those back in my soil? So we're at the very tip of the iceberg, guys, on learning about these mycorrhizae, all right? We're, we're, we're just starting to learn how we can take advantage of them. I do have some lists that I put together, and I've only found one or two references that says if you have this species, you'll increase soybean yield by 10%. Okay. The problem is when you go to buy these compounds, most of the time they don't list the species and you don't even know if you have live mycorrhizae spores in that or, or whatever, whatever you're getting. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. They do have the ability, these spores are produced during the crop fruiting stage or grain fill stage. They overwinter and they have the ability to survive long dormant periods. Okay. That's the key thing. All right. Spores like eggs are a lot slower to form. Uh, they germinate near the roots. 
uh, spores may live longer, can go three years. Compare that to some of the dry root fragments. Those are the internal ones. They're very good fresh. They can last for a few weeks, but typically uh, they, they age pretty rapidly. They are the fastest. If you want to get mycorrhizae established, get some, some roots of a plant that has what you're looking for. They're the most effective way to increase your, your mycorrhizae hyphae infection in newly disturbed soils. And then you've got the external soil hyphae. Those are the networks that have already been out there, okay? Most of us, that's why once you get a CRP land, or undisturbed soil, or a hay field, that's why we don't want you to disturb it, because you've already got this network set up. If I can just put my corn plant in there, think of the benefits that you're going to get, because you don't have to build this network, okay? There's a rhyme to reason why we are promoting some of the things that we are promoting. Most people think we're nuts, but once you understand all the science behind it, you'll see why all these things are interrelated, okay? So if you've got CRP that you're putting back into production, most of the time it went in your worst ground. Why is it when I talk to these farmers, now that they're taking it out 10, 15, 25 years, 20, 20 years later, that all of a sudden now it's producing the best? It's because of the mycorrhizae and, the, uh, and that microbial community, okay? That's what we're looking at. There's 8 to 90 spores per gram or greater than 40,000 spores per pound of soil, okay? Do the math on that on 2 million pounds, okay? The, uh, 2 million pounds uh, of soil in the top 6 and 2 thirds inches. Think about how many spores could be out there. I mean, I don't even want to do the math, okay? These spores are fairly small. Uh, they, uh, periods of dry weather plus low temperature really stimulate spore development, okay? So going into the fall, that's usually what happens. What are the things that they like? Well, they like higher potassium helps, but too much nitrogen and phosphorus actually hurts them. They like no-till with diverse plants. They like the lower pH. They want a moisture right around 18%, okay? Soil temperature, kind of intermediate. Don't want it too hot. Don't want it too cold. Some heat and temperatures will increase uh, the spore development. They like loamier soils, okay? That's what they tend to like. Sandy, loamy soils produce more spores. Uh, they do need some carbon dioxide to help them germinate. And uh, they, uh, it also, uh, infection increases when that plant starts to germinate. You know, I looked at all this stuff and I decided I got to try this. And so I started looking in the research. I got an experiment going about 10 miles from here. I live 10 miles from here. And I got this little uh, box in the back of my uh, uh, garden in, in a small area. It's 12 feet wide, 16 feet long. What did I do? I went out and I went to eight different sites, got eight close to virgin soils as I could, Mixed them all together, got a barrel of each one of these, okay? Spent some time about uh, two years ago, and then I made up my mycorrhizal mixture, okay? I put in some, some potting soil, I put in some sand, and mixed all these together, and I've been growing my, my crops in there, and what am I going to do with that? Well, probably about next year, I'm going to take that and put it through an old drill or a lime spreader, and see if I can't re-inoculate my field, see if I can't get some, some new things going. And it actually shows that you can, every year, increase your spore production by about 250 times, okay? So it, you can do this. Now, I was looking at it, I was thinking, hey, there might be an opportunity to make some money. Nope, can't do it. Why not? Because I'm not legally allowed to sell you anything. I can do it on my own property, but I can't do it and give it to somebody else. Guess what I would have to do? I would have to sterilize it before I could give it to you, all right? <laughs> kind of defeats the purpose, I think, all right? So I kind of gave up on that idea. I was getting interested, and I thought, hey, I wouldn't mind trying this, but I'm going to try it on my own farm. Here's that one that we got to worry about. It's called rhizophagus, okay? Uh, if you want to buy some products, you got to be real careful because liquid products have a shorter life period. Uh, ARS investigated 19 products. What did they find? Only three of them had living spores. The dry inoculants are better. 
Uh, but a lot of these fungus are regional dominated, okay? So you want to be careful that you get something fairly local where you're at. You don't want to bring in something that's not good. Almost all of them had this rhizophagus, okay? So be real cautious of buying a bug in a jug, especially if you're getting it outside the area. You want something that's, that's local. we got about five minutes left the way it looks, okay? This is that rhizophagus. It's extremely dominant, and I'll show you some pictures of this and, and what, how many there's, there's all together, but the problem is it can tolerate tillage. And so it is really dominating in our agricultural soils. The problem is, again, it's almost, it can almost be a pathogen. So we really don't want to buy a bug in a jug and buy a whole bunch more rhizophages because you're wasting your money. You want to buy the species you don't have, and you need to know what those species are, okay? So it just shows you some of the, the propagals. This is research that was done in Brookings, South Dakota. Just shows that canola, wherever we had oats, we got a, a huge increase. Vetch helps, and then we can do the different combinations, and where we get the most is where we have all the different ones together. So biodiversity really increases your mycorrhizae. This is in wheat. And it just shows you that the rhizophagus is really dominant. Wendy was doing some uh, research on this. She actually found a wheat variety that she was trying to test for the mycorrhizae to see which mycorrhizae it liked, and it didn't like any of them. Think about how we're producing our wheat and our corn today, folks. We do it under conventional tilled systems. We do it under very high fertilizer conditions. These mycorrhizae enhance fertilizer, but if that plant is growing under condition where it doesn't need the mycorrhizae, over time we're selecting against mycorrhizal infe infection of that plant. And so some of our corn and, and wheat species, especially wheat, have now become non-mycorrhizae. So what we want to look for are plants that are kind of more like your workhorse varieties on corn and soybeans, okay? We want something that can tolerate some of those other conditions, and we also want them to be highly mycorrhizal, dependent on those mycorrhizae if you want to make the mycorrhizae improve, okay? So something that you might want to start looking for it's pretty hard to get that information from our seed companies because that's not the way they're used to doing it, all right? But you got to ask them for that. If you start asking them for those things, maybe they'll start to provide that information, okay? Here's an oat variety, and look at the multi-species we've got. That's why we love oats, because it's such a nurse crop. Nurse crops are ones that are highly mycorrhizae. They increase the mycorrhizae, the different species that are out there, okay? And that's why, why it's so beneficial, okay? Capturing that diversity with our cover crops, look at what happens. All of a sudden, we get all these other different species out there. And, and you know, this may be the simplest thing. We don't even have to know which ones are beneficial. They'll come with time. The voles will bring some in. The wind will bring some in. If you start growing the good crops out there, there's a few spores out there. Pretty soon your fields will be populated with these things, okay? So the good news is maybe we don't have to spend money for a bug in a jug, okay? And if you don't have some, you can always kind of fall back on what I'm trying to do and maybe find some really good soil, mix it together, and get some of these things growing. You might have to do it for two, three years, and then you can spread some out in a field if it's really hurting, okay? You can do that on your own. You don't have to pay somebody to do all this, okay? It's a little bit of work, but you could maybe do that, all right? How long do these things last? All right, got two minutes, all right. How long do they last? About seven days. Uh, sometimes maybe 7 to 15 days, but what will happen is as that root grows, it will it'll come back and it will reattach at a different level in the soil, okay? And with that, got a, we've got just a few more slides. Most of them aren't as, quite as important. Now, come on, I think we'll just end with that. Any quick questions? <sighs> That's a good question. I don't even know the answer to that one. Um, uh, the, the mycorrhizae don't like flooded soil, so my guess is that there's not enough oxygen there. But as soon as that soil dries out, I think it helps more in a drought 
because in a drought they are a source of water. In waterlogged soils, I'm, I'm not sure because it's, the research that I've seen shows that it really they like sandy, loamier soils a little bit better. Uh, and I imagine if there's just if it's waterlogged. You just can't get water. I mean, there's water, water everywhere, but you can't get the water into the plant. So that's part of the issue.